Have you ever felt like you were trapped in poverty, like it's an escape room, like it's a, it's a maze, like it's, it's some place that feels like that no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you try, you can't get out? Well, in this video, I'm going to show you how you can finally, once and for all, for the rest of your life, escape the poverty programming trap. Because poverty program, why do I say escape the poverty programming trap? Because Poverty can't exist in your experience unless it first exists in your expectation or in the expectation of someone who was responsible for you while you were growing up in the world. So we have to, be, we have to understand that poverty is a mindset, just like wealth is a mindset. And we talked about that on other videos, like the difference between rich people, poor people, and middle class people is not how much money they have, but it's how they think about money and what they think the primary purpose of money is. Poor people think the primary purpose of money is paying bills. Um, so therefore, every time they get some money, they go pay some bills. So to them, it's not even payday, it's transfer day. We talked about the fact that to middle class people, they think the primary purpose of money is to buy things they can't afford and pay their bills on time so they can main day, maintain good credit, so they can buy more things they can't really afford. But rich people believe that the primary purpose of money is to turn it into more money before you spend any of the money that you just made. That's the, that's the mindset that makes the difference. That's the programming that makes the difference between poor people, rich people, and middle class people. Now, why, we, why do we talk about programming? What's another reason we talk about programming? We talk about programming because understand this. We will never behave consistently in a way that's inconsistent with our programming. Your programming produces more of your results than your conscious, conscious thinking does. Like, it's ingrained in you. It's ingrained in me. But you can change the programming. And if you've been programmed for poverty, you will be poor until you change the program. So what I'm going to do in this video is show you how to escape the poverty programming trap. So what's the first thing you have to do? Well, you have to understand that poverty programming is a trap and that you need to escape. There's a verse in Scripture that says in Proverbs uh, 6 4, it says, um, Go to the ant. No, Proverbs 6 4. It says, um, Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself, that's talking about escaping, as the roe from the hand of the hunter, as a bird from the hand of the fowler. So you have to escape from, from um, sleep like you escape from like a deer escapes from a hunter, like a bird escapes from a bird trapper. Okay, and then it says, um, it says, go to the ant thou slugger, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O slugger? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands of sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy one as an armed man. So poverty... One of, the, we have, one of the things we have to do if we want to escape the poverty programming trap is we have to learn how to have a vehement hatred for poverty. Like, the reason I'm not poor is because I hate poverty so much, I beat it as far away from my door as I possibly could, and then I beat it some more. I hate poverty. I hated, what, and maybe you don't. Maybe, maybe, maybe you hate not having other people's approval more than you hate not having your own autonomy. I don't know. Maybe you hate, uh, or maybe you hate people thinking you're crazy more than you hate not having enough money in the bank. Like I don't really, Marin, you're so obsessed with money. I don't really care if you think that. I don't care. I hate being broke more than I hate you thinking that. And until you hate, like being broke and not and having to rob Peter to pay Paul until there's a knock on the door one day and it's Peter and Paul and they're both there standing with their hands out talking about I want my money today. Right? If you're tired of living like that, I got tired of living like that. I got tired of living a life where I made this beautiful woman, all these great promises, and now here she is, eight months pregnant with our first child, and our electricity and our water are both disconnected. Not because I wasn't willing to work hard. I was working hard. But what I was working on wasn't working for me. It was working on me, but it wasn't working for me. And I got tired of be, having, to tell, have it, having to tell my children no before I even knew what the question was because I knew we didn't have enough money to buy it. I got tired. I hated the fact that when we got ready to go on vacation, after working hard for a whole year, we're going to take a two-week vacation, and we're going to take two days and drive from Pennsylvania to Florida because I lived, we lived in Pennsylvania at the time. My wife's parents lived in, Pens in Florida. I mean, in, I said Pennsylvania to Florida. Pennsylvania to Texas. My wife's parents lived in Texas. We drive for two days to spend 10 days with our in-laws, and then drive for two days to get back home. 
I hated that that's what vacation was. Vacation wasn't going to Hawaii. It wasn't going to Greece. It wasn't going to Israel. It wasn't flying, uh, going to Europe or going to Mexico or going to Canada and spending the day, uh, spending a week in Banff. It was just like, like you go and you, you work on vacation so you can spend time with your family because there's no other time you can. I hated it. I hated it. I hated everything about it. I hated the fact that the four months of my married life that I was on welfare, yes, I was on welfare for four months, I hated when I was sitting in that welfare office and that woman said to my wife, she said, you know, we could give you more money if he wasn't in the house. First of all, he has a name. Second of all, it's not the house, it's our house. And you see how I get, like, I got an attitude. You say, why? Because I hate poverty. I hate what it does to people. I hate that poverty forces people to eat junk food because they can't afford real food. I hate the fact that poverty causes people to drive raggedy cars that cause them to get in accidents because they can't afford a car that'll keep them safe. I hate poverty. And until you hate poverty, you will not beat it far away from, far away from the door enough that you don't have to deal with it anymore. So you have to hate poverty. That's like, you want to get out, you want to escape the poverty program chat? Like, just develop a disgust with being broke. Develop a disgust with not having enough money. Like, love not, uh, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's right, the love of money is the root of all evil. But you don't even know what that verse means. Like, people who quote it to me on YouTube, it's all, it literally makes me chuckle every time I read it. Money's the root of all evil. First of all, it doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. My friend, it does say love money. It does say love money is the root of all evil. But the key word in that verse is the word all, which means all types, all manner, all kinds. It does not mean all every single solitary. The love of money is clearly not the root of every single solitary evil in the world. Like think about it. It can't be. If that were the case, Adam and Eve would have eaten the fruit because the serpent paid them. The love of money is not the root of every single solitary evil. The love of money is the root of all, type, all types, all kinds, all manner of evil. What does it mean? The love of money is the root of all evil means people will do all types of things if they love money, right? For the love of money, people will sell drugs to children. For the love of money, uh, pharmaceutical companies will sell drugs to the population that they know will harm them. For the love of money, cigarette companies will sell tobacco. The love of money is the root of all types, all kinds, all manner of evil. That's what it means. So if you want to quote it, Quote it in its context with its definitions and understand what you're talking about. Anyway, I hate poverty. I hate it. I loathe it. It's disgusting to me. I hate what it does to people. I hate what it does to families. I hate the arguments that it causes between husbands and wives and the arguments that it causes between children and parents. And I hate the fact that there are people living in, a dark, in, living in the dark right now because they don't have money. There are people living under a bridge because they don't have money. Like, at some place, at some point in their life, they did not hate poverty enough to beat it away from the door. And I hate it that much. Like, I really hate poverty. I, I hate inconvenience. I hate being hassled. Um, and, like, for instance, like, when I fly, I only fly on private jets. People think I'm flexing. I'm not flexing. I just hate TSA. I hate it. It's so stupid. It's like, it's like they find the dumbest people in the world and they give them this job, and they wanted to be a CIA agent, and they couldn't pass the test, so they only they could be a, C, a TSA agent, and they think they're a CIA agent, and they think they're saving the world for me because I have a brace on my leg. Oh, well, no, we got to take you in the back room, and we have to scan, we have to see the type of... I'm like, no, you don't. I go through TSA all the time, and I'm TSA pre, and they still, it doesn't matter. It, if one wants to flex, if a TSA agent wants to flex, there's nothing you can do. You have no recourse. I hate that. So I fly private, so I don't have to go through that. I hate the fact that, like, the airports lose your luggage. They if you miss your flight, flat out of luck. But if they cancel your flight, you're still flat out of luck. I hate it. So I'm going to make enough money so that poverty doesn't impact me in negative ways because I hate it. When you hate poverty, when you hate, like, I love having a choice. Money gives me choices. Mary, do you love money? I love having a choice, and I hate poverty. When you do, when, like, what, what do I mean when I say hate poverty and hate poverty's partners? What are poverty's partners? Poverty has a lot of partners. I'm going to name four partners that poverty has. Um, I'm going to name four partners of poverty that you have, to, you have to hate, and you have to hate them enough to keep them away from you, far enough away from you, so they don't rob you of all your chances. So the first one that I'm going to name is sleep or and I'm going to put sleep slash laziness. The Bible says, love not sleep. That it's, this is what it says. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. 
So people, I love sleep. I don't love sleep. I sleep because it's essential. I like the way sleeping makes me feel. I like the way it makes me feel. I like feeling rested more than I like feeling tired, but I don't love sleep. Sleep is not an objective in itself. It's an objective for an objective. And that objective is to be rested enough to go out and create something that other people value enough to pay me for it so I can live my life without being in poverty because I hate poverty. I know I've said that a bunch of times, but I'm, I'm emphasizing that because I am telling you until you get to the point where you hate poverty. Like when I was poor, I hated poverty enough not to watch the electronic income reducer. What's that? Television. For some people now, it's their smartphones, right? I hated poverty enough not to watch television. I'm not going to watch other people live their dreams while I'm living a nightmare, right? I hated it. Um, I hated poverty enough, like my daughter was a teenager. My daughter was a teenager, she's the youngest. She was a teenager when we had a television, like with channels. She was probably 14, 15, 16 years old before we had a television, why? Because I, I finally felt like I was making enough money where I could afford to watch television. I wasn't gonna watch it while I was broke, why? Because I hated laziness, I hate sleep. So sleep, that's one. Two, gluttony. I, I don't even know how to spell gluttony, so. We're just going to, I probably didn't spell it right. Gluttony, you spell it. I can't believe this. He's doing a YouTube video. He didn't even spell check. Good. When you do your YouTube videos, spell check. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Uh, see, you hate misspelled words. I hate poverty. Like, everybody has their thing they hate. It's okay. Be yourself, okay? So, so gluttony. What, is, what, do, what do I mean? Like, gluttony is a poverty programming trap. Here's what the scripture says. The drunkard and the glutton shall lie down together, and drowsiness will clothe the man with rags. It says, woe, the scripture says, woe unto you, O land, when your princes eat, when your, when your, prince, when your king is a child, woe unto you, O land, when your king is a child, and when your princes eat in the morning for drunkenness and not for strength. So the scripture says we should, like, Gluttony, like eating too much. Why? Because when you eat too much, you don't have enough energy to go out and fight poverty away from your doorstep. Right? So, gluttony, okay? Drunkenness. So, drunkenness is also, like, yeah, but Maya, you don't understand. I just need a drink after work because, because I'm just so stressed out. I submit to you that maybe you're stressed out because you're broke. And your needing a drink is keeping you broke. Now, personally, I quit drinking when I was 11. And now, as an adult, <laughs> I don't have any brain cells to sacrifice on the altar of I'm stressed out. I'm not going to do it. I'm not, why? Because I don't want to be broke. We're, we could call all of these, we could call all of these, these um, partners of of poverty, we could call them the partners of poverty called self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. Self-indulgence creates poverty. Isn't that fascinating? What creates wealth? Service to other people. Remember I did a video on uh, money is not wealth. If you want to see a video that, that would really explain what I'm talking about right now, it's called money is not wealth. Money is not wealth. What's wealth? M wealth is your ability to create value for someone other than you. That's your wealth. And the, the, greater, like, the greater your ability is to create a greater value for a greater number of people, the wealthier you are. So, self-indulgence leads to poverty. Now, there's another one. Are you ready? Can you handle it? Um... Number four, evil. Evil is a poverty programming trap. Why? Because poverty is the result of spiritual warfare. Satan is a god of lack. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. If somebody kills, steals, or destroys, guess what you have? Less. Lack is the result of the enemy. Jesus said, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Okay, so let's, let's, let's look at this. What does the scripture say? What does the scripture refer to the devil as? That old serpent, the devil. Right? The old serpent. That old serpent, the devil. What old serpent? The old serpent from way back in the Garden of Eden. What did he do? He, he deceived Eve by getting her to focus on the things she lacked. And her giving focus and attention and intention to the things she lacked caused her to lose all the stuff she had. They had the abundance of, of every tree, 
of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. They had the abundance of every freely. The serpent said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So he took out the word freely, added the word not, changed the meaning. The woman then took out the word freely and every. She said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the trees in the midst of the garden we shall not eat it, neither shall we touch it lest we die. Satan said, ye shall not surely die, but God doth know the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, do you all see what just happened? Satan got her, her attention on what was missing. And as soon as she got it, he got her attention on what was missing, then she said her intention on that thing that she had no right to, and that thing caused her to lose everything she had. Interestingly enough, in the Hebrew language, the word for rich, like when it says, and Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold, it's the word assure. Now, that's the word for rich, it's assure. But did you know? That in Hebrew, oftentimes, when you're spelling a word one way, it means one thing. But if you spell it backwards, it means the opposite. Isn't that cool? Isn't that, isn't that such a cool language? Right? Okay. So here's what's really interesting about the word um, um, assure. If you spell it backwards, rasha, if you spell it backwards, it means the opposite of poor, I mean, the opposite of rich, and the opposite of rich would be poor. That's what you think, right? But it doesn't mean poor. The opposite of poor, rasha, or even rasha or rush, or ro rasha or rosh means evil. Wow. The opposite of rich is evil? What does that mean? Here's what it means. It doesn't mean poor people are evil. Here's what it means. It means the implication is that societies that practice evil have always been throughout human history, I want you to think about this, have always been poor societies. Think about that. Think about the poverty of the Soviet Union, the anti-God Soviet Union. Think about the poverty that's associated with the witchcraft of a place like Haiti. It's, all I'm saying is evil creates poverty. And so, if you're going to hate, if you, if you want to escape the poverty programming trap, you have, to, you have to hate. You have to hate poverty and its partners, and then you have to fall in love with the partners of prosperity. What are the partners of prosperity? The partners of prosperity are diligence. It's working like hard. Uh, the hand of the diligent maketh rich, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Right? You got to fall in love with serving other people. Serving others? Do you realize all of the money that you desire right now that you don't have, it's in somebody else's pocket? They'd happily hand it over if you could provide something to them that they desired more than they desired the money. How cool is that? See, your, pro your biggest problem is, your, your, your biggest problem is you only think about solving your own problems. I think about solving other people's problems. Like, I obsess over other people's problems. So when you fall in love with the partners of diligence, you can be diligent, okay? I mean, you can be wealthy. Oh, how about this? Oh, this is one of my favorites. Business. Business is one of the partners of prosperity. Here's what it says in the New Testament. And that you studied, and this is first, uh, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It says, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, working with your hands as we commanded you. Why? that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, that's talking about paying your bills on time, and that ye may have lack of nothing. How many people do you know that pay their bills on time and have lack of nothing? Almost none. Can I get a witness? Right? So why? Because we're not practicing these principles and we've not fallen in love with the partners of prosperity. Another partner of prosperity is wisdom. The Bible says there's treasure. There's treasure and wine and oil and substance in the dwelling place of the wise. What is wisdom? Well, wisdom has some prerequisites. First prerequisite is, is ignorance. Ignorance is the absence of truth. The second one is knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of truth. The third one is understanding. Understanding is the assimilation of truth. And then finally, wisdom is the application of truth. So wisdom is an action word. It's actually doing the things that you know will work because you know they work.
and the wisdom is from above is not the same as the wisdom is from above, uh, from beneath. Like earthly wisdom, the scripture says, like the wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. What is that? It's the enemy. Like literally, the wisdom of this world is the enemy. What enemy? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Earthly, sensual, and devilish. Same thing. The wisdom from above is what? I want you to wrap your mind around what I'm about to say. The wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable. It's not first peaceable, then pure. So the wisdom that's from above doesn't seek to get along with everybody at any cost. It stands for what's right first. And then after it's pure, then it's peaceable. Then it's easy to be entreated. Well, wisdom is one of the partners of prosperity. So if you fall in love with learning, you fall in love with business, you fall in love with serving other people and you're diligent about it, you can escape the poverty programming trap. I trust that this will help you. Make sure you go and watch our video on how to get rich because that will help you on your wealth journey as well. And it will help you escape the poverty programming trap. I'll see you on the next video.